Bonjour, mes amis, and welcome to the next installation of the Country Series. This time, we're going to be focusing on France. This was as voted upon by you guys. The poll results as of midnight on two, well, last Tuesday was 31% France, 30% Germany, and they were just going back and forth the entire time. So I have a France Country Series planned out. After that finishes, I'm not going to hold a poll again. I'm just going to go right into the Germany one. Might do a few videos in between there. We'll find out. But right now I have 15 videos that are planned for the France country series. And we're going to be starting off with the entire history of France in 23 minutes. I just want to get this out of the way, go through everything at once and really just sort of get into all the topics and then we can take a step back and go more into detail. So I have, as I said, 15 videos planned out chronologically. This one, we're gonna be starting with everything and then we're gonna go back way into the past. If you want to know what the video series is and hey, maybe you wanna make a few adjustments. Maybe you have a really good video that you're like, hey, we could, I could put it in here. Maybe you could make this, you know, swap out one of these videos go join the Patreon. There, I have already posted the video list and I've already posted the Excel document that I made and you can edit it and say, hey, maybe try this, maybe try that. And it's much easier to get in contact with me that way than just leaving a YouTube comment. Without further ado, let's get into this. The entire history of France in 23 minutes, part one of the country series on France. If you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let's get into it. Always, always, always. <laughs> Upon the collapse of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, I didn't East, expect him to the be Germanic Irish. people okay. known as the Franks came to inhabit the region that is today the country of France. The entire area had oh, been sorry, virtually Scottish. abandoned, which saw the rise of several tribal Frankish kingdoms. After some time, these kingdoms became united as one under the Merovingian dynasty and even expanded far beyond its origins. Ruling for some 300 years, the kingdom of the Franks became too large hmm. and communication became impossible. Now ruled by the Carolingian dynasty, the kingdom was divided into three, with West Francia being the one we're going to focus on. Oh, Perhaps the most well-known king this early in history is Charlemagne, who yes. became king of the Franks in 768 and became unquestionably we'll the most powerful man in Europe at the time when, on Christmas Day 800 AD, he was crowned Emperor of the Romans. After the death of Charlemagne, the Carolingian dynasty was weak and finally came to an end in 987 when Hugh Capet was elected by the Lords of France. As king, he actually had very little power. His authority barely extended beyond Paris and Orléans. Hmm. His power came from the influential electors who voted him into the position and, more importantly, the clergy. In Interesting. And so one thing that I'll get into in the Germany country series, but I won't touch on right now, it's just the Holy Roman Empire overall. And this was obviously, this is, I mean, this is a whole country series in and of itself is doing just the Holy Roman Empire, though it's not obviously just one, one, uh, one country, but the sort of politics of France, this is one thing I'm really interested in getting into of how this whole system sort of worked out. And so, yeah, just wanted to make that comment there and that anything that's Holy Roman Empire Yes, France obviously has a lot to do with it, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of similarities and connections there, but I will be doing that in the Germany series. 1066, the Normans invaded England, which resulted in on and off fighting between France and England, starting a rivalry that would last for centuries, eventually culminating in the Hundred Years' War. And now they just... Oh. Now they just compete over football, you know. And they also played a huge part in the Crusades to recover the Holy Land from Muslim rule, which was initially very successful and then a horrible failure. Yeah. One of many. After the death of Charles IV, the throne of France was claimed by both Philip of Valois and Edward III, King of England. After some disagreements, the French declared a state of war in 1337. The English showed their military superiority over France, winning several victories in battle and even capturing the French king at one point. Hmm. A truce was signed in 1360 as Edward renounced his claim to the French throne and England were awarded substantial French land, land which would almost entirely be recovered by France in the next half century. Yeah, and so what's interesting here is that I, I guess the, this is when Gurney and Jersey was won, or were they always owned by the UK, just out of curiosity? So hold on, does it say it here? No, it doesn't. I wonder actually, when was Gurney and Jersey a part of a part of England? Um, hmm, interesting. I wonder if that was during this piece because that's what it looks like or if it was from before. Maybe let me know in the comment section below. 
1393, a regency was put into place for the French king Charles VI, who was incapable of ruling due to his mental illness, so the queen ruled on his behalf. Okay, killed four A power struggle knights. between Burgundy and Orleans resulted in a civil war ah. when John the Fearless had Louis of Orleans assassinated in 1407. And the infamous... I'm curious, too, where does the fleur de lune, that's the, the, the classic French symbol, you know, the one that was just on the shield there, where does that come from? I'm actually kind of curious, because that, that seems to be the symbol of France, and it looks like it was actually on both their shields there. I would have thought that maybe, because I saw the Orléans one first, and I thought, okay, maybe that's where that originates from, but it seems to be on both crests there. Battle of Agincourt, the Burgundians did nothing to try and stop the English, who were once again heavily defeating the French. John the Fearless captured Paris in 1418 and declared himself the regent of Charles the Mad, but John was later murdered by a friend of the king. Seeking revenge, John's son Philip the Good sought an alliance with England as the English king was recognised as the heir to the French throne. Both hmm. Charles VI and Henry V died in 1422. The nine-month-old Henry VI was crowned King of France in Paris, having already been crowned King of England, while Charles VII was crowned in Rheims. I did not know that. Hostilities started and up again, and the French morale was boosted by the emergence of a 16-year-old girl named Joan of Arc, who claimed yes. to have heard voices from God to drive the English out of France. The French did indeed turn things around and would eventually win the war. Unfortunately for Joan herself, she was captured by the Burgundians and later burned at the stake by the English. Famous Burgundy yep, made peace painting. with France and the last major battle took place in 1453 with a decisive French victory, effectively ending the war and English claims to the French throne. Cool. Towards okay. the end of the 15th century, France had themselves a problem, a rapidly growing rival right at their doorstep. The Austrian House of Habsburg, through various political marriages over the years, began to encircle France. In 1477, with the death of Charles the Bold, the last male heir of Burgundy, his daughter married the Archduke of Austria, Maximilian I, giving ah. the Habsburgs huge amounts of land on the French border. I see. This, okay. coupled with the fact that various French kings had claims to various parts of Italy, most notably Naples and Milan, resulted in over 65 years of wars between the French and the Habsburgs, in a rivalry that would last for centuries. When Charles V became Holy Roman Emperor in 1519, having previously become King of Spain, the French were completely surrounded by lands that were directly or indirectly under his control. Fascinating. This resulted cool. in yet more wars in Italy. Overall, the Habsburgs came out ahead and France would continue to be surrounded. During this... See, those series of war, that's what I want to learn about. And so <laughs> that's also why I want to do this video is just to get the whole overview. And then it's like, all right, let's get into the details after this. So that's cool. I'm looking forward to this. Time was when France experienced a golden age of art and culture known as the Renaissance. And was also mm -hmm. when France began to explore the new world. Yes. And that's important for the history of Canada as well. And I've talked about that before. And maybe Canada will do a country series one of these days. But obviously the French-English rivalry is kind of the basis of Canada, the understanding of Canada, and when in the Plains of Abraham the the, um, the French were defeated and the English won, is pretty much became the dominant force in the founding of Canada and would continue to be to this day. In the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation caused many countries yes. in Europe to turn their back on the Martin teachings Luther. of the Catholic Church and the Pope. Although France remained mostly Catholic, Protestants made up a substantial minority, causing tensions which eventually led to an all-out civil war. <laughs> the tensions began with the persecution of French Protestants, also known as Huguenots, under the reign of Francis I. Merely being Protestant was punishable by imprisonment or even execution. The war broke out in 1562 when Francis of Guise, who briefly ruled France as regent to the young Francis II, massacred 60 Huguenots. Francis himself was assassinated the very next year. After a brief period of uneasy peace, the Huguenots hatched a plan to capture the king and the queen mother, but when this failed, they massacred 24 Catholic priests and monks, starting the civil war up again. Of course. Attempting to ease tension. Oh, I just can't stop killing. Nations, king Charles IX arranged for the marriage of his sister to the Protestant Henry of Navarre. This delighted Protestants but horrified Catholics. The king ordered the killings of some of the Huguenot leaders, but spiralled way out of control and turned into a three-day massacre of about 30,000 Huguenots. Oh my the massacre was organised by the Guises and was widely suspected to have been assisted by the Queen Mother. 
Charles IX died in 1573 being Henry III king. With the death of their younger brother Francis what? and the fact that Henry was in his 30s and yet to produce an heir, the next in line to the throne became, quite unbelievably, the king's ninth cousin and also brother-in-law, Henry of Navarre. This period huh. of the war is sometimes referred to as the War of Three Henrys, Henry III, Henry of Guise and Henry of Navarre. The king had Henry of Guise assassinated and fled from Paris into hiding, but he himself was assassinated of by a knife to the abdomen. Of course. As he was dying, he instructed his senior officers to be loyal to Henry of Navarre, who became King Henry IV and converted to Catholicism, famously stating that Paris is worth a mass. Hmm. The king passed the Edict of Nantes, which granted some rights to Huguenots, which pleased neither side and tensions remained high. Henry IV was assassinated in 1610. Before his death, colonisation of the New World began under his rule and yes. continued for several decades afterwards. As I discussed. The Thirty Years' War started between various Protestant and Catholic states of the Holy Roman Empire. It's funny too, it's just how different and how much times have changed really for the better. Just the amount of, the amount of blood that has been shed in Europe over Protestant or Catholic differences and just... Yeah, happy to live in a time where nowadays, you know, you don't need to ask people whether they're, you know, whether they're Protestant or Catholic, and then, you know, you might get a kick in the head if you get the wrong answer. <laughs> and was mostly a poor murdered religious war, but later escalated into a continent-wide power struggle, becoming less about religion and more about politics. France, although a Catholic nation... Sorry, what were those phases again? The Bohemian phase, the Danish phase? Okay, yes, yes, we'll get there, we'll get there. ...sided with the Protestants. The reason for this, the Habsburgs. Countering yep. their long-term rival was more important. The Thirty Years' War was one of the most destructive wars Europe had ever seen, with approximately 8 million deaths, and the result of the war was... inconclusive. Mm. The Peace of Westphalia granted some territory to France, Switzerland became independent from the Empire, and the independence of the Dutch Republic was recognised. Yes. More than just the territorial changes though, the Thirty Years' War was a real turning point in European history, both in terms of religion and politics. It put an end to the violence of the Protestant Reformation and more generally was the beginning of freedom of religion. Politically, it was arguably the first war that really highlighted the importance of the balance of power, the yeah. necessity of ensuring that one nation doesn't become too powerful to dominate all the others. Yeah, and that's a video series I want to do too, is, is on the Vienna Conference, right? The conference or the treaty, the Conference of Vienna, as it's more commonly known, is just establishing the balance of power after the Napoleonic Wars. We'll get to that. Don't worry, we'll get to that. But it's interesting how these sort of conferences, I didn't know that it had originally started in the Thirty Years' War, but now these balance of power things, I mean, arguably, it's still understood today to have a balance of power throughout the world, although arguably it's committed more through trade and politics than actual pure warfare. The Sun King. After 23 hmm. years of marriage and four stillbirths, the Queen of France finally gave birth to the nation's future king, Louis XIV, who ruled France for 72 Louis too. years, so the many longest Louis. reigning monarch of European history. Yep. This impressive feat was helped by the fact that his father died just a few years after his birth as he became king of France at just four years old. During his minority, the country was ruled by his mother, Anne of Austria, and Cardinal Mazarin, the country's chief minister. In 1648, Paris rose up in revolt because the country was sick of being ruled by a Spaniard and an Italian, as well as increased <laughs> taxes to pay for the debt of okay. several decades yeah. of war. The revolt was suppressed and didn't really achieve much, however it had a huge impact on the now 10-year-old King Louis. He vowed to be a king that would never be revolted against. Louis XIV became known for being an absolute monarch and was yeah. the most powerful king in all of French history. He is often quoted as saying, L'état c'est moi, I am the state. <laughs> Louis XIV was a devout Catholic and believed in his policy of one king, one law, one faith. Yeah. And to that end, he revoked the Edict of Nantes issued by his grandfather Henry IV, causing a mass exodus of over 400,000 Huguenots and major economic problems. Louis XIV was involved in several wars during his long reign, which expanded France's borders to their near modern-day extent. First there was a war against Spain, then against the Dutch, 
a war against basically all of Europe, and most importantly of all, the War of the Spanish Succession. Yes, the Spanish another king topic. died in 1700 without any heirs. Oof, what a what a nice face. Succeed him, probably due to several generations of inbreeding. But anyway, he left in his will the entire Spanish Empire to Philip of Anjou, grandson of Louis XIV. Having a dual monarchy of France and Spain would seriously upset the balance of power, so the Grand Alliance that had been formed against France in the Nine Years' War regrouped in support of their candidate for the Spanish throne, the Archduke of Austria, Charles of the Habsburg House. Now, Despite the odds being severely stacked against them, and despite suffering some heavy defeats early on, France actually managed to hold their own, and after nearly a decade of war, fighting had basically become deadlocked. In 1711, the situation completely changed. The Holy Roman Emperor Joseph I unexpectedly died of smallpox at the age of 32, hmm. and the Archduke Charles became the new Holy Roman Emperor. Great Britain immediately backed out of the war against France. The whole reason they were fighting Shocking. against France was to prevent one monarch becoming too strong and disrupting the balance of power. But now the Habsburgs had the potential to become even more powerful than France could have ever been. Negotiations had to be made. An agreement was made where Philip would become King of Spain but had to renounce his claim to the throne of France for himself and his ancestors. Mm, okay. One year after the war ended, Louis XIV died at the age of 76 and, having outlived his son, grandson and even his first great-grandson, was succeeded by his second great-grandson, Louis XV. Now that Yet Spain more no wars. And so that's, that was another thing. So while I was creating this list of, of 15 videos, there's a lot of wars. <laughs> and there was even some, while I was doing some research beforehand on basically the timeline of French history, if you will, which unlike something like Germany, doesn't really have a start date, if you will, or even Canadian history arguably does have a start date. Um, there is a lot of wars. <laughs> There's a lot and a lot of wars. And some of them in this video I will be covering. Some of them I will not be covering. I'm not going to spoil it yet. Go check out the Patreon if you're interested. Hunger had a Habsburg monarch. They sought to retake lands that they had lost in the Treaty of Utrecht. And France actually joined an alliance against Spain and their fellow Bourbon monarch. The Spanish <laughs> were decisively I mean? defeated. Spain was no longer the great power it once was. Yet another war of succession broke out this time in Poland. Although very little of the fighting actually took place in Poland, it was primarily fought between France and Austria and their respective allies. The Austrian-backed Augustus III took the throne, but French-backed Stanislav was made Duke of Lorraine, which would be inherited by France on his death. France once again was hmm. at war with Austria. This time the Austrians themselves had a succession crisis. Charles VI was the last male heir of the Habsburg House. To ensure the inheritance of their land, they passed the Pragmatic Sanction in 1713, allowing their daughters hmm. to inherit their vast possessions. While most initially accepted this, when Maria Theresa ascended to the throne in 1740, a war ensued between all major European powers. The French led the alliance against Maria in favour of the new Holy Roman Emperor Charles VII, Prince Elector of Bavaria. After seven years of war, Maria successfully defended her Habsburg inheritance. Speaking of wars that lasted cool, seven I years, there was also the Seven Years' War in 1756. Uh, yes. Long-term rival Austria was actually allied with France, while the British and Prussians allied with each other. The Seven Years' War was a truly global conflict. The war has even been described by some as World War, war Zero. Zero. Yep. Although some minor skirmishes happened in North America between the French and British colonies, the war really took off between Austria and Prussia over Silesia. Unfortunately for the French, the war was lost and Britain became the superior colonial power as France was forced to cede the majority of the colonial possessions to Britain and Spain. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I was talking about of during these... During the great battles here, right, General James Wolfe infamously fallen at the at the battle there. And one of the most important fun, uh, facts of Canadian history, something that we learn in school and that English-French divide, as I said, been there to this day. But, I mean, look at the territory that Spain has at this point. I mean, look at this, right? And all of these, you write the 13 colonies would eventually go, United States of America, etc. It's just interesting how much of a role French, French, France has played in European politics, even in world politics, right? Because we haven't even gotten to the colonialization that they do later uh, and during the later periods. It's just really interesting how this one single country has affected billions 
of lives. Although the British won the war, it was financially devastating for them. The increase in taxes on the colonial subjects soon became one of the yes. factors that led to the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Keen for revenge against Britain, France was more than happy to help. I think France even famously gave them a steamship, or it was something along these lines, where the French actually backed them financially, were backing the rebels um, during this period as well. I remember some story along those lines, but I mean, I think that's pretty funny that <laughs> the French are going and backing these American rebels just so they can basically screw over the British. I think that's it's kind of funny. For centuries, France had been ruled by a political and social system known as the Ancien Regime, in which the power was concentrated with the wealthy and privileged. Yep. The people were divided into three estates, the clergy, the nobility, and everyone else. The first two estates made up about 3% of the population and had huge tax exemptions, with the third estate paying most of the taxes, taxes which had been increased due to their support of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. The Age of Enlightenment caused many people to question the king's right to rule, the church's influence in politics, and the entire nature of the hierarchical structure of French society. Attempting to solve the country's financial crisis, the king gathered the Estates General, the king's advisory board, which hadn't met since 1614, which consisted mm. of representatives from all three estates. Why? What was the point of this, though, exactly? Okay, so it hadn't met since 1614, so now at this point, <laughs> it's been a very, very long time. Okay, I have seen this photo before and I had heard of the estate, but why had it not met in so long? I don't know, okay, maybe that's something we'll get into, I'm curious. Disagreements, however, caused the third estate to leave and form their own government, declaring themselves the National Assembly and vowed to not ah. give up until France had a constitution. Shortly afterwards, the king dismissed his financial minister, Jacques Necker, which caused riots in Paris, and three days later, the storming yes. of the Bastille. Famously. In August of 1789, feudalism was abolished, and the assembly adopted the Declaration of Rights of Man and of the Citizen. The king, beginning to fear for his life, attempted to flee the country. Yeah, and it's important to note too, and this is something I do know a little bit more about, but how radical of an idea this was at this time, right? Consider what's going on in Russia, where there's, there is absolute monarchy, Britain less so, but certainly within the Holy Roman Empire. And I mean, most of the world at this point is living under authoritarianism. And human rights are basically kind of non-existent. Right? Not even close to the human rights that, that the majority of the population has nowadays. And so for this document, this very radical document to come out, and for the king then eventually to be overthrown, I mean, it got a lot of the rest of the European powers very, very scared. And basically the status quo institutionalists right, would eventually um, rise up against France. And there comes everyone's favorite, Napoleon. But was discovered and captured. This outraged the people and a petition drive to depose the king was organised, but things got out of hand and 50 people were shot dead as the revolutionaries began to split into various factions. Yep. Austria and Prussia vowed to help the king by invading France if his life was threatened. So France just went ahead and invaded Austria. Because why not? In 1792, the monarchy was abolished and France was declared a republic. King Louis XVI was found guilty of high treason and was executed by guillotine. This is when things took a turn for the worse, when yep. the radical revolutionaries, known as Jacobins, seized power and began to execute just about anybody in a period known as the Terror, led by the ironically named Committee of Public Safety, headed by Maximilien Robespierre. Yes. A process of de-Christianization began, even creating a new calendar and new days of the week. This led to counter-revolutions and eventually on the 9th of Thermidor, year 2, Robespierre was denounced by his own people and later he himself was executed, ending the reign of terror. Outside of France, the French army were- Again, we'll get into this, don't worry. <laughs> That's why I'm not saying too much in this video. We'll get into some, some of the details of it. Actually having great success despite a large coalition of nations fighting against them, largely due to the leadership of a certain military commander known as Napoleon Bonaparte. Yes. Napoleon went on to take control of France in a coup d'etat, declaring himself first consul of France. <laughs> Funny, so he says, the revolution is over, I am the revolution, whereas Louis the <laughs> Louis the Fourteenth said, I am the state. Ironic how that works. The French Revolution sought to stop one man from having absolute power, but they had effectively just swapped one for another. 
Napoleon's rule Arguably. of France was very much a military dictatorship. He was king in all but name. Yep. Five years after seizing power, Napoleon assumed the imperial title, being crowned Emperor of France. During his rule, he was almost constantly at war with most of Europe, as no less than seven coalitions formed against him, as the various monarchies of Europe fought to protect the status quo. Napoleon was initially incredibly successful and for a long time undefeated in battle. He moved across Europe. Yeah, the Grand Armée at this point was the largest, most effective and strongest fighting force in European history. It is just, it is hard to understate how effective the Grand Armée in its various forms, because of course it wasn't just one army the entire time. You lose a lot of men when you fight seven coalitions. Um, but also the leadership um, eventually, and I can't remember his, his, his name off the top of my head, but one of them would go on to become the King of Sweden. Right, and that's why um, there's French uh, lineage within the Swedish royal family. Um, it was one of his one of his right men, though. And yeah, just again, we'll get into this, but just an absolutely fascinating part of European history. And Napoleon is arguably, you know, one of those men that you can look at and you can go, yeah, changed the world, hands down, changed the world. Europe, creating puppet states and installing his family members as royalty of the countries he conquered. Yep. His greatest victory was in the Battle of Austerlitz, which led to the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> Securing victory... <laughs> you heard that right. The dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire, which had existed for hundreds of years at this point, dissolved it. Insanity. It's, it's hard to even imagine something like that happening in, in modern times. It's craziness. Imagine dissolving the EU. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, it's insane to think of. ...against Austria, Prussia and Russia, the only real threat to Napoleon was Great Britain. A planned invasion of the British Isles had to be called off after the entire French fleet was destroyed at the Battle yep. of Trafalgar. Yes. France instead opted for economic warfare with the introduction of the continental system, which for Eventually he's going to bug Russia. ...trading with the British. In 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia for refusing to adhere to the blockade on trade with Great Britain. Yes. This turned out to be a fatal mistake, as Napoleon lost half a million men in the brutal campaign. Encouraged by his defeat, the countries of Europe once again formed a coalition against him and decisively defeated the French army in the Battle of Leipzig, eventually leading to the surrender of Napoleon. The monarchy was restored done, with though. Louis XVIII being crowned king, and Napoleon was exiled to the island of Elba. However, he managed to escape less than one year later. Gain some so what's funny is that while he was on Elba, he completely reached, he completely uh, changed the island too. He gave it a civil administration service. He'd opened up. Like there was, <laughs> it's just he completely transformed all of it in, in, into his ideal of, of society, right? And it's just, if he had just stayed on his island, maybe, you know, maybe he might have been an effective ruler. Maybe he could have came back peacefully, but such was uh, not in his nature and then yeah we'll go from there the port in paris overthrew the monarchy and raised an army but the coalition formed yes, soldiers if there are one among you who wants to kill who want kills who wants to kill his general his emperor here i am and obviously famously all the soldiers defected right to him despite the fact that they are all there to capture and probably kill napoleon and against him and he was defeated at waterloo by britain and prussia Napoleon abdicated for the second time and he was exiled to the even more remote island of St. Helena, yes. where he died at the age of 51. And he might have been poisoned. Through the After lead decades of unrest, well. France once again had a monarchy, but the French Revolution and Napoleon had such a profound impact on not only France but Europe as a whole. Yep. In 1815, the monarchies of Europe convened at Vienna to restore the pre-revolution borders as best they could. France was to remain a great power. France soon had another revolution as the people were once again sick of being ruled by the absolute monarchy of Charles X. The king was overthrown in what became known as the July Revolution and he yep. was replaced by the citizen king Louis Philippe, a distant cousin of Charles X. Almost simultaneously, France invaded Algeria, which became an incredibly important part of their colonial empire and yes. within a few decades ruled huge parts of Africa. And the scramble for Africa, also something that I will say this, we're not getting into this for the France country series, but I think that that will be a whole video in and of itself is talking about the scramble for Africa, excuse me, and how important it was and why these two countries, Ethiopia and Liberia, managed to stay independent. We'll get into that. 
Throughout the July monarchy, there was a distinct atmosphere of revolt and protest in the air, so to protect the monarchy, political meetings were banned. In 1848, coinciding with many revolutions throughout Europe, the king was forced to abdicate, and France once again became a republic. Louis Napoleon, the other Napoleon's nephew, was elected president. In 1851, unable to run for re-election, he organised a coup and declared himself president for life in a referendum of questionable integrity. France briefly became an empire again when Napoleon III took the imperial title in 1852. Napoleon III was nothing like his uncle when it came to war and diplomacy. Yep. Yep. Poor decisions and humiliating defeats culminated in a war with Prussia in 1870, which ultimately led to the unification of Germany, who became the dominant power on the continent. Yep, Sick. and this would obviously have very wide-ranging <laughs> consequences for France, obviously most notably being the First and Second World War. But yeah, um, while many great things can be said about Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon III, yeah, not so much. The French Empire quickly collapsed and France became a republic for the third yep. time. Captured, chatting Ever since the unification, Germany had been a major rival of France. In order to try and isolate them, France signed an alliance with Britain and Russia, the Triple Entente. Yep. France joined the First World War in 1914 when Germany declared war we'll on them for this. mobilizing their army in support of Russia, who mobilized their army in support of Serbia, who had been declared war on by Austria. Germany's plan was to quickly defeat the French, and they actually did get close to Paris, but the Allied powers were able to hold them off, and the Western Front quickly became a stalemate in trench warfare. And just very briefly, so this is called the Schlieffen Plan, which was named after General Schlieffen, which was a German general, where basically the line on what is modern Alsace-Lorraine was basically unable to be penetrated. So the German command, they thought that they could quickly crash through Belgium, take Paris, capitulate the French, and then focus on the Russians. That didn't happen, and here we have trench warfare. Despite winning the Eastern Front against Russia in 1917, the tens of thousands of American reinforcements became too much for Germany, who were yep. slowly pushed back, eventually resulting in victory for the Allies. And not only that, it wasn't just the Americans, although that obviously did not help, but it was also the naval blockade. The naval blockade that England had on Germany throughout basically the entire war had really, really affected the populace. At this point, there are revolts happening. Bavaria even is, is revolting, and there's a brief stint of... of of communism basically uh, anyway so that that's something else but uh yeah at this point the population is revolting the kaiser isn't really in charge anymore um basically everything is the, the state is practically being controlled by by ludendorff and uh and hindenburg and so yeah it's not just the americans but again it's way more complicated than that but that's just one thing i wanted to add with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, French Marshal Ferdinand Foch said, This is not a peace, it is an armistice for 20 years. Fascinating. If only he knew just right. how true his words would yep. be. Yep. Mm -hmm. In 1939, France declared war on Nazi Germany after Hitler's invasion of Poland. However, yes. they initially took a defensive position and therefore were unable to prevent the phony war from being what it's conquered. Called. France itself was invaded in 1940 as the Nazis bypassed the French defensive fortifications known as the Maginot Line by simply going around it via Belgium. Unable yes. to deal with the... But not only going around it via Belgium, but crashing through the Ardennes Forest, which the French command had believed at that point was impossible to penetrate. So it's not like they just went through Belgium again, but rather specifically through this forest that was um, unguarded. And it was very, 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 very fast because now you have... Um, mechanized infantry and obviously armored divisions as well. German blitzkrieg tactics, Paris soon fell, and most of France would be under Nazi occupation for the next four years. Yes. General Charles de Gaulle declared himself head of the government in exile in London, and when Nazi power began to decline, the resistance was formed and Paris was liberated in 1944 as the Allies were ultimately victorious. I mean, the resistance wasn't formed because specifically of Nazi decline, but anyways. It's fine. This in is, the 1950s, is France began the process of decolonization, starting with Libya. When it came to Algeria, though, things were a little mm. more complicated. Yes. Algeria was considered an integral part of the French Republic, and with France indecisive about what to do, a war for independence began in 1954. The crisis yeah. in Algeria caused the French Fourth Republic to collapse, and Charles de Gaulle, who previously resigned from politics, returned and proclaimed a new constitution. Algeria officially gained their independence in 1962. 
With the establishment of a new constitution, the French Fifth Republic was founded, the country that France is today. And yes. so that's where I'm going to leave things, because in the words of historian John Julius Norwich, all history books must have a clearly defined stopping place. If they don't, they drag on <laughs> till they become works on current affairs. And for me, 1958 nice. is where I've decided to draw the line. Cool. And so there, this is a great timeline here. Kingdom of France, the Third French Republic, the Fifth, brief stint of Nazi occupation, Francia, West Francia, Kingdom of France. So a lot of the videos, well, you know what, actually, I'm not going to spoil it. You guys will find out. Uh, let's let's finish this off here, and then I'll close. Thank. You. Perfect. Okay. Didn't even need to stop myself there for one second. So yeah. So that's. Thank you all very much for joining me for the first part of the France Country series. I liked this the entire history of France in 23 minutes. Again, didn't want to pause too much, although this video is long enough because we're going to be getting into the details. I'm excited that you guys are joining me for this one. If you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Join the Patreon if you want to suggest a specific video, if you want to see the list ahead of time and you think, ah, maybe, you know, I really know a lot about France. Maybe you could tweak this there. I'd be happy to have you there. Thank you all very much. Take care and I will see you guys in the next video.